it's actually essentially a progress report um, on on a very long project that, um, of course, I've been thinking about for many years. Is uh, the original question was we have these mirror pairs um, that construct was marked many years ago, and how do you prove prove uh, uh, homological mirror symmetry in some form for these pairs? Okay, but over the years, um, well, actually, I had some some uh, many uh, discussions with Mohammed from 2012, maybe to 2017 or so, until he finally um, we finally uh, uh, agreed that this project will never surface, um, and he moved on to other things. And uh, fortunately, I have a new call author on that, and uh, Tim Peretz, one of the benefits of moving to Austin. Um, and, um, and many things have happened since, since this uh, original question that made me uh, a lot more hopeful that we are actually uh, getting very close. Let me, let me, so let me uh, say what the advances are. So first, um, there's finally something that one, I believe, is safe to use on the virtual fundamental classes. Um, there have been several approaches, and the one that speaks most to me is Parton's uh, BFC formalism. Of course, there are many others, uh, but this is something that I can see I can use very efficiently, and will, will work well in, uh, in the setup. The other is uh, well, there have been many advances on symplectic cohomology. Uh, so back in maybe 2012 or so, the literature was rather limited. Now we have all these uh, things that I can look into and see, OK, I just have to copy and modify a little bit. Um, notably, I mean, many foundational work, of course, uh, um, by, by, by Roman on compactness issues. And, and uh, by Tirani, Tirani, um, McLean, Zinger, on uh, understanding normal crossings uh, in, 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 uh, in symplectic geometry. Um, and then notably also by Ganatra and Comaliano, which is very close in spirit uh, to what uh, I'm going to talk about for pairs x comma d assuming x minus d f one. Um, then there are generation criteria for the Fukaya category. Um, starting with, with uh, Mohammed, um, and uh, I will tell some other version um, that has been done by. Uh, by, by, by Ganatra and, uh, sorry, by, uh, by um, Peretz and Sheridan, and, uh, and also by Ganatra. And then on, on our side, uh, we finally understand much better how to get, uh, how to work with punctured chromophytin invariants. It's a long collaboration with Dan Abramovich and Chile Chen, Mark Gross. Um, and that uh, led to intrinsic mirror construction. Unfortunately, a rather long paper that uh, has been out since last September. Um, so taking all these together, uh, there is some hope to actually proving, to going from, from uh, to showing that f of x uh, is actually uh, equivalent, infinitely equivalent to to uh, to 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 the uh, to DB, DBO of the mirror side. Okay, so let me start with uh, explaining a little bit about these intrinsic mirror pairs, or maybe more appropriately for today's talk. Let me sell this as a version of quantum cohomology, actually just degree zero quantum cohomology for pairs x comma d. 
because this is really what, is, what we have been doing. Uh, this is kind of a, a joke uh, that, uh, that the thing that's kind of went at the very beginning of mirror symmetry and quantum cohomology actually is, seems to be really at the core of understanding mirror symmetry and it's all in there uh, but with an interesting twist. So um, we start with a pair x comma d and the only assumption I make is that the logarithmic canonical bundle should be uh, effective, at least supported on D. So the most favorite situation is, of course, if, if, if uh, x comma D is a log Calabial pair, where the right-hand side is 0. But this goes, uh, this is a good condition from the point of view of some, uh, uh, we don't need uh, minimal models. It's a lot more general. You see it's supported on D. Yeah? It's on D, right. So D's uh, uh, components. D are the components of D. And D is normal crossings. OK, X smooth, of course. And uh, so I call this the absolute case. And for homological mirror symmetry, I can tell it quite a bit more uh, about what is the kind of more traditional case where I have a degeneration. Um, so X to S. Uh, so that would be would be just some permeable space curve, and uh, and then the x x d is just the total space in the central fiber. Okay, so and that's problem. So it's non-compact, but we have this nice morphism to acid simplifies the situation. Um, so uh, yeah, so then then given that uh, we can build something called the so dual dissection complex. So that has has a simplex. Actually, I just take a cone here. Um, so R larger equal zero to n, the simplicial cone, one for each uh, zero dimensional stratum. So this is just uh, di zero intersected di n. Is not empty. And it has an integral structure. So just the integers in here, into z to n, uh, log equal zero, that I want to view as carrying contact orders of curves with a boundary. Yeah, so what I mean by this, let's think of something like, uh, like P2. then uh, I just have these, what looks like the fan of P2, but you should really think of this as just being union three copies of R2 log equal zero. And then uh, the point here, for example, is say two zero, that would be an order two contact here, or something like three two, could be something like a mu parabola going into that, into that deepest stratum. Okay, so the integers here con contain, these, uh, contain these contact orders of, of curves. And then I build a ring, um, so which is this QH0, XD, by taking generators uh, given by these integral points. So the ring is um, direct sum R times theta P, and P are the integral points. Not that the origin is, the origin also makes sense, right? That, that would be a point in the interior. Um, okay, so and then what is the coefficient ring? R is, is, is a kind of, actually I don't need C. Oh, we're going to rational numbers. Uh, and then it's some completion of the curve clauses, uh, effective curve clauses on X or some finally generated version of that. Okay, so these, these will contain curve classes. And then of course, so that's uh, the module structure, and then of course the, the, the question is what is the multiplication? And that's the sum over contact orders R in classes beta. And let me put a comma here. P, Q, and R are slightly asymmetric. Um, 
So beta corresponds, contributes with T to beta, that's a monomial in here, in this coefficient ring, and then, and then we have the theta r. Okay, so that is the rule. And the NPQR count curves um, with two positive and one contact R that is kind of less or equal to all. And we wonder what the, what, how this makes sense. So the NPQR beta. I'll give an example to show you, illustrate what this is. So you, you look at curves, g to zero curves, class beta, two my x comma d, and I want the f two points, just ordinary context p q, as in log of Witten theory. But the third point is is a bit strange. I want I prescribe minus r. Okay. So what does this mean to say minus r? So let's let's do an example. Let's compute that mirror. So of course, see the theorem that is then is that the string structure. Let me put it down. Maybe first is associative. It's associative. Associative cumulative ring. And the idea, of course, it is totally simple. It's what you know from the WDDD equation. You just look at the modular space with four more points. But uh, the subtleties of logarithmic gluings and make this a very long paper, fortunately. Yeah, but the idea is totally simple. Yeah. That's exactly as you think it should be. Um, okay, so let me let me look at an example. So what is the mirror of P2 with, with union three copies of P1? Well, you get different mirrors depending on what, what kind of um, D you take, okay? So I have to be precise and say, I'm doing this. Um, so let me draw that diagram uh, again. <coughs> so this is your P2, this is the B. And uh, I claim that the, that the ring you get, the result you get if you do it, is x, y, z, damn it, t here. Uh, so q, we have one curve class t, and then x, y, z, and the single relation x, y, z minus t. Um, yeah, let's look at this equation x, y, z equal t, equal t. Of course, that's not a three-point function, it's a four-point function. And it would indeed count uh, curves where you fix one point here, that's the outgoing point, corresponding to this t times one. And then you look at curves, let me draw them like an amoeba, lines with contact orders one, one, one. Okay, these are the x, y, z. I haven't said what x, y, z are. So the x would be in my notation from before, theta 1, 0, uh, the y is theta 0, 1, and the z is theta uh, minus 1, minus 1. Okay, so these are these three generators. Um, how do we get this in terms of the three-point function definition? So we'll have to do a few computations, right? So we have to, how do we get x, y, z equals t? So that comes from, let me get another blackboard. So we first compute x times y. I want to get theta uh, 1, 1. Sorry. Um, yeah, theta one one. No, that's wrong. Theta minus one minus one. No, that would be z. Uh, let me see. I want this one. I want theta one one. Yes. Okay. 
So that would be the tropical diagram. So each of these curves that, that I compute will have tropicalizations. They look like ordinary tropical curves, except the outgoing point doesn't have a ray. Yeah, so the incoming ones have rays. These are the P and Q. But the R uh, is actually going in the negative direction, so it's not going out, right? So R is pointing in. And, uh, and there's no positive contact. So what would this mean in terms of geometry? It means that you have a contracted curve. You know, so there are no curves of negative contact, but if you measure contact in terms of degree of line bundles, of course, if you have a contracted curve, you can have negative line bundles. Um, okay, so this would be a curve where everything gets contracted to that point here. Um, and it just happens that the contact orders here at P and Q prescribe first order contact here, first order contact here, and the R is kind of a negative contact in the other direction, okay? which you can't see, you cannot draw. But this, such a log, stable log map exists, or punctured log map. So, and then, so this is the first thing, and then we want to see that theta 1 1 is the inverse. Um, of, of z, right? So we want theta over 1 times z is up to this t. And that would be where you now have to go through the origin tropically. So you would start with something which would be this r. Uh, sorry, that's a p now. Um, and then the r is 0, and then we have the q here. So what are these curves? Now the R is in the, in, the, in the origin, and then we have these contacts. It's a line like this. Okay, so this roughly gives you an idea of uh, what, what these ring structures are. And hopefully that already reminds the more symplectically oriented people in the audience of uh, symplectic homology as a product structure, the pairs of pants product structure. Can I ask a question? Yeah? Perfect. Point of view uh, is that this red thing uh, part of the proof of like WDBB or something like that, of associativity? Because I mean, you said XYZ equals T times 1, you can see that because of this curve. But this curve has three inputs and one output. Mm -hmm. And then, then you somehow actually proved it. Yeah, that, I mean, that, you, you're right. I mean, that would appear in, in the proofs. So I mean, the, the actual one that you would Shouldn't that be in the line that passes through the column? Should you find this as x, y, z? No. Um, oh. Uh, no, no, no. Um, uh, well, I didn't want to, to make the prison. You have to fix, well, there are choices. You have to fix the, uh, you have to fix the, the uh, cross ratio of the four points, yeah. right? Just as in W, D, V, V. So you have a P1. And then I fix 0, 1, some point u infinity. What you want is a degenerate situation where actually your curve would, would split. So if you move that point into the origin, you would have a contracted component. I don't want that at the moment. Yeah, yeah but, but the point is if you want to see this as a single To see the, to, to for see the proof, the I would. I would, exactly. I have a one dimensional model I space, and both this one and the one you were speaking of appear in the. That is x, y times z. It's one boundary of the modulus. It's one boundary part. Oh, yeah, that's the, the, the yes, glue. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Okay, okay. And this yes, one yes, appears yes. when you try to prove that no. it's equal to the other composition. Okay, okay. So, okay. okay. so for the division so far, I don't have to get this negative tangency to the normal tangency. Exactly. And these are the only ones where you actually have traditional counts. Yeah. yeah. And that relates to the work of, of Tony Yu and, and Sean, Sean Kiel. Uh, they, they, they need this. They have a definition, a similar definition, but they need to be able to kind of pass through the origin. They need, at the moment at least, uh, some, some uh, algebraic torus contained in X minus D. Okay, so that was just a short wrap up. Uh, wrap up took, of course, longer than I hoped for uh, <laughs> um, of, of this intrinsic mirror symmetry construction. Okay, so then what would you, do we want to do on the Fleur theory side? So there are quite a number um, 
Ah, maybe I should say that because I'm just seeing this here. Uh, one important thing is, of course, the whole thing is, is a family fiber over the spectrum of that ring that looked a little awful. This non typical non Assyrian ring of spec. Uh, uh, spec C or spec formal, depending if you work absolute or relative, um, or Q even, right? Q of N E of Y. <coughs> so you get this, you get this proj or or uh, proj Q H zero, or spec Q A zero, uh, spec formal Q H zero. Over these two things, um, and uh, that has a that's a local ring, so it has a has a closed fiber, um, and uh, and the and the closed fiber is the proj or spec of what is called the Stanley Reisner ring. So whenever you have these kind of simplicial complexes, you get this Stanley Reisner ring that essentially is is the ring you see here. Okay, so whenever you have two integral points that are not in the same cell, it's just zero. And whenever you're in the same cell, it's just, it's just a mono, kind of mono, monoid ring that you see from the integral points on one of these calls. Okay, so the center fiber, or the reduction model of the maximal ideal, is just a standard Reisner ring. So QH0 XD mod M is the Stanley Reisner ring <coughs> of, of P as a special thing. Okay. So what are the third theory rings that we are interested in? I mean, of course, um, what we're really, really interested in, oh, actually, first I should say, um, I prefer now to work in the relative situation. Yeah, you will see that some of the statements make sense also in the absolute situation. I have a little more clue of what to do with the relative situation. So we have these, uh, an analytic model now. This is your mess. Um, proper, um, colonial families. And uh, what we are, of course, ultimately interested in is the Foucault category of a general fiber. Well, let me write xt, t non zero. So, and, um, so the first thing is there sh should be a mirror object of the, of the O of 1 bundle, um, or first of the O bundle, mirror to O. That should be an SYZ se uh, section, section of the SYZ version. And now, how to obtain this very canonically? Um, if I assume that this thing has a real structure, and that occurs in any of the models I wrote down with Mark, we can always write them down over the real numbers. So, in these situations, we would have some Lagrangian L0, which is just a real locus, a positive real locus. So there's a good sense in saying what that means. And it is a uh, section of the XYZ vibration. Actually, it's, it's homeomorphic to B. Not this B, actually. It's what we call, <laughs> damn it. Uh, it's a B intersected with, uh, how do I write this? Maybe if I want the homeomorphism, I just take B intersected with this, with the sphere of large radius or something like this. Okay, just the homeomorphism statement. Okay, so that would be the SYZ section. Um, and then we have monodromy that we always have. A symplectic monodromy. And then from these two things, I can build up all the other twists. So if I apply mu to L0, Mu is like tensoring, is mirrored to tensoring with O of 1. So I get all these other copies. Um, so that gives L case. 
mu k of L0, and that works for any k. Okay, so you get this um, uh, subcategory um, twist generated by the LKs in f of x. And the generation criteria that I mentioned in the beginning make a statement when this is actually uh, a quasi-equivalence, an A-infinity quasi-equivalence. So generation statement. So I'm, I'm giving the one that was given by, um, by Peretz and Sheridan. based on Mohammed's work. And then there's another formulation, another proof by Ganatra. Um, it says that, uh, that if, you, if you have um, what they call core mirror symmetry, so if you know that we have an I infinity <coughs> Quasi equivalence with, with uh, well, that would actually be a dB, right? That's an old one, which is a dB, or K. I mean, all K, right? Um, so this is uh, just dB, uh, or I then we already know that LK is F of X. And then even better, we can get the A infinity structure on, on this guy um, by result of Polishchuk, which says that if I look at, at um, at something like the ring structure you obtain for all these kind of positive things. So from when you go from O of K to O of L with L larger than K. So this gives the homogeneous coordinate ring. O of, uh, let's call D maybe, D larger equals zero. So the ring structure Says it suffices to check M2, which is the ring structure, um, for, for the uh, homogeneous coordinate ring, respectively the corresponding mirror objects, plus one higher MK, plus one MK. I mean, I'm just an explicit MK. So you, that was have some sheets F1 to uh, F, uh, F0 to FK. Uh, F1 to FK. And showing that this is non zero. OK, so basically, what I want to say is that if we we have full control of the homogeneous coordinate ring in our picture. And if we can show that these homogeneous coordinate rings, that this is the same as the ring structure you get on the corresponding uh, Lagrangians and monodromy translates also Lagrangians, then we are done. That proves homological mirror symmetry. So of course, That still seems a little hard to work with, with these Lagrangians in complete generality. Um, and maybe some other rings, which I can then give to my symplectic geometry friends, and they will care about the rest of the equivalence might, uh, might work better for me. So what are the other uh, rings um, I believe uh, should be isomorphic to these rings that we get here. So let me take the as next one 
one that was suggested by Tim, uh, R of mu. Uh, so that could be called something like the symplectic monodromy ray. I'm sure I discussed this with you, Mohammed, at some point too. <laughs> It's a very cute thing. So you would just start with xt as a symplectic manifold and this monodromy. Um, and then you build uh, the symplectic mapping cylinder. Sorry, mapping torus. Which is the xt cross r larger or equal 0 cross s1. Um, well, I shouldn't write it like this. Cross interval and then I'd identify um, the, the two boundaries. Okay, so I want to view this as a symplectic vibration over R cross R larger equal zero cross S1, which is just C star. Okay, I will do origin. And then you can do Fleur theory on this guy. Yeah, so you, for, you have you have these um, uh, invariant points of the mu, and then you take Fleur theory of of this. Um, let me call this. Um, well, that would be actually x t and then mu two minus r. This is counting holomorphic cylinders uh, inside uh, inside that inside that uh, synthetic magnet torus. For some reason, there's a change of sign that you need here. Okay, so that's the second trick. We may end up w working with that at the moment. I mean, it's, the setup I'll, I'll present is pretty insensitive what you do, what you feed in on one side, but at the moment, I'm more hopeful in working with symplectic uh, cohomology and proving that you actually get a ring isomorphism. Okay, so then the C, maybe it should have been B, is something that was uh, featured in Denise's talk, is the red Foucault category. Now there's one problem here, um, well, maybe it's not a problem, I don't know. There are various versions, of course, of, of red of, uh, Foucault categories here. The one that was, uh, that was uh, suggested featured in talk by Denis, uh, looks like this. So you would have, actually, maybe I should, yeah. Maybe I should, I should do it like this. So here is your, your xt, or maybe the lt in xt, or L, sorry, lk in xt. And then you kind of wrap it around. And, and then you do these, these things to we have something else. This is one version that you could work with. So this L0, so the L case extend to LK tilde, so I was a little L in, in Denise's talk. Um, another thing that is, seems more natural for me or closer to the way I'm thinking, or it's more hopeful to relate to anything that I know how to deal with, is to look at the extension Assuming we are working with R with a real locus. So that would be the real Lagrangian. That doesn't work really. So that would be the real Lagrangian. So that would just be, the, as we call it, L tilde. So that's just XR. Um, facility contains a little too much information because the real locus, what you really want, is a positive real locus. But I don't know how to extend the positive real locus over that guy. So the only thing I can extend is the actual real locus, the total real locus, which has more components than what you care for. Okay, so this thing is expected to contain a little too much information. But it has the advantage that you can just work with real algebraic geometry to actually compute something. Okay? So there's presumably some version of real gamma Witten theory function gamma Witten theory that you can use to, to try to um, try to relate it to this regular theory and the corresponding uh, ring structure you get. 
Okay, so and then finally the last one, and that's the one I will say a little more, which is the um, which is close to the work of uh, Ganatra and Homaliano, is this symplectic degree zero cohomological degree zero uh, symplectic cohomology of this pair. So what would this uh, what would this be? Um, so you have to change. Of course, sh star of x comma d will be a direct limit of uh, Fleur homology groups of x with certain Hamiltonians. So the first thing uh, that is a little worrisome is typical in symplectic cohomology, people would like some Liouville domain or something like this, so they can use compactness arguments, uh, maximum principles. We cannot do that, okay? So the interesting cases are exactly where x minus d are not f fine, okay? Of course, you could look at pi x comma d, x final or something like this, but at least in a degeneration case, that's very far from being f fine, okay? It's, it's proper over some, over the disk. Um, so, or over a1 curve. Um, so you, you have to include d. Okay, so this will be a version of symplectic cohomology uh, that contains stuff that lives entirely in D. Okay, so it's just a warning. Um, so how, how then, then in, um, so you could, may want to compare this with what's written in the paper of Ganache and Bogmaliano, um, that in most of these papers, um, I should also mention, of course, um, Pascalev, who did that in the surface case before while I was at UT, Austin. Um, so typically, you write down a very specific Hamiltonian article, family of very specific Hamiltonians, and compute explicitly. Okay, and then you get control over the generators. Um, that doesn't seem a very viable way to do this. Uh, and from the definition point of view, there's not much reason for doing this. So we don't want a very, if you work with virtual fundamental classes, and compactness being assured from this map, from applying the maximum principle by composing this pi, so this is not a disk, um, there's no worry on compactness. So we can just write down this direct limit for certain H classes of H's where, which come by pullback from the base. Okay, so let's just do this. Should be totally insensitive to what I'm doing. And I wanted to extend over, so this is the, let's call this, uh, uh, confusingly, maybe or not, T. Okay, so that should be some profile, doesn't matter much. Um, and you order these by the maximum of this H prime. So they should get steeper and steeper. You achieve this by moving that uh, value at zero up and, and moving, uh, moving the support in. So and then uh, you should still get these continuation maps for whenever you have an H1 and H2 properly scaled. And that will be a definition. Okay, so then the, um, the conjecture so we have two conjectures now. So first, all these rings obtained from A to D should all be isomorphic. So some of these are purely symplectic questions. Yeah? So for example, 
trying to understand how the symplectic monodromy ring uh, relates to the Fukaya uh, category product, or the symplectic monodromy ring uh, relates well, to this. Uh, the A was the Fukai category of, of, of a general fiber. The, the homogeneous coordinate, the part of the. Yeah, so the, 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 the ones you get from the positive yeah. twists. Okay? So in conjecture two, let me just formulate for SH0 that this symplectic version of symplectic cohomology of the total space is actually isomorphic to QH0XD. So and uh, Shiel and Daniel proved the version of this for the case where X is actually uh, Fano or X minus, X minus D um, affine and uh, asymptotically, okay? So just looking at the essentially the degree zero part and uh, understanding how the generators are. Okay, so that's of course a whole juice in, in, in the story. Yeah, sure. What's the relationship between the relative quantum and What's the question, what's the difference between the relative and the absolute quantum homology? It's totally different, okay? So the absolute quantum homology can be pretty boring. The relative quantum homology always contains lots of information, okay? Uh, I'm not saying quantum homology is boring, okay? So I'm saying this thing, you know, I'm just doing S I'm just doing well, where am I? Uh, QH of a zero, okay? So if you do QH zero of anything, I mean that <coughs> has only the, the one, right? So 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 can you always recover the quantum cohomology from the irrelative? Um no. I mean not from this one. I mean there's a I mean, of course, it's, it's something like QH of a star of X comma D, and that would contain the compact pack ones in there too, sure. Yeah. So it's a, it's a kind of... Uh, but it's also a subsequent normal side of the room, because in some situations, variety, mere varieties are not permitted that, uh, like H to zero. Algebra's graded tunnels should be not permitted if that very focus get on the but I think by assuming that he has this real involution, ah, yeah, he's probably yeah, gotten rid of non commutativity. Right, so exactly. There is, there is certainly room also in our program for these twists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll simplify a little bit. Okay. Yeah, we. Right. Um, at the moment, I'm, I'm making a statement about conjecture 2, I think. Yeah. Okay? So that one I'm pretty confident should be true the way it's stated. When you want to relate it to the Foucault category, that gets a little, because you need at least a Lagrangian, right? Mm -hmm. So, and I, without anything, I, I, I wouldn't know how to get that Lagrangian, and that's where, where this comes in. Okay, so let me, let me then, so, if you have lost track of what I'm doing here, <laughs> let, me, let me wrap up. So, if, what I was saying is, if you take conjecture one plus conjecture two, plus one computation of the messy product, higher messy product, one single computation, okay? Not the whole messy product, just for one specific thing that I'm hopeful one can do, okay? Plus F M K of some, some Lagrangians, non-zero, L0, L0 uh, L1, whatever, uh, or maybe L1, L2, LK is non-zero. That would reply homological mirror symmetry in this setup, okay? So in the rest of the talk, let me give a little bit of, of technical juice to this, uh, to all these claims. Um, so something on conjecture two. So let me first, um, so there's first, there to actually, actually kind of two problems that can be solved independently. And for one, I might get help from a student of uh, John Harden, which would be good. So that's the, the, the project with, with Tim is to go from symplectic to complex analytic. 
So there's a version of these uh, um, zeroth degree relative quantum cohomology um, that is just working on, in, in the analytic category, okay? It's a complex analy C analytic, okay? That's a trivial remark, okay? You just replace everything algebraic. You define this by working with a complex analytic delete Mumford stacks and blah, 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 okay? So that, that's not uh, difficult. And the hard part is to prove that this, that there should be an isomorphism here. Okay, so the idea is pretty obvious. You would have to count cylinders. So you would, what you want is you want to write down a morphism from, um, from uh, uh, QH0 to SH0 by counting cylinders. By the usual fashion, So that would start a cigar-like picture. Um, confusingly, of course, the output is comes in here. So that would be uh, one one uh, periodic orbit. So X. Maybe I should call it X. Let's call it Z or something, okay? So this would be a periodic orbit. Okay? And then I have one outgoing point, P. So that would be a puncture, actually. How do you get these things in the easiest if by working in the total space, I mean, what would this look like? So this is fibered over a disk. And then you can produce such, um, such cigars by taking kind of a little circle around that guy. But actually, maybe just for artistic purposes, let me draw it here. And then you, um, you have a little disk touching touching a five center fiber at a point. Actually, most of these things will touch deeper points. Okay, so you take a multi-section <coughs> through this of that thing, and that has a boundary, and that would be the uh, periodic orbit, approximately. Okay, so these are the objects you count. Uh, maybe something that is not obvious to many people in the room, if you do this, what you get at the center fiber, you can actually put a, a, a negative puncture in there, okay? It looks positive, but it's actually a negative thing if you think of extending it to, uh, yeah, so if you do something like this on the central fiber, take a component of the central fiber or some curve in the central fiber and connect it with some section, then, and then you remove that thing here, you get a puncture here, okay? So these would be these punctures. And uh, then to prove that this is actually uh, well defined, so commutes with a differential. Of course, it, we have no differential here, yeah? So that was just because we just take the contact on us, yeah? But there would be, sorry, they, um, so there are no differentials here. Um, but something could come up here. And in general, of course, you would, you would, you know, you have to degenerate the thing and you get all these bubbles on the central fiber. Whenever you have a bubble, it will be in the central fiber. <clears throat> so there will be a gluing theorem where you have to deal a little bit with these complex analytic models that you have on the central fiber with something more symplectic here. Uh, what do we do with the Hamiltonian? As a Hamiltonian, so there's always a kind of stabilizing of the domains, just contracting all the bubbles. So we can specify some cutoff function. So in the neighborhood of this outgoing point, there's no Hamiltonian, okay? This is pure complex analytic geometry. While out here, this is pure symplectic geometry. 
Okay. Unfortunately, John Carden has this, has already done all the work uh, to set up Hamiltonian Fleur theory um, for this for this setup. Um, and the pair of pants product, well, then to show the ring homomorphism, you you you, uh, you have a similar idea in uh, uh, in how to connect two incoming things with one outgoing thing. So for the ring homomorphism, you have to study diagrams like this. We have to object that somehow this was set up by you know, Fukaya Ono 20 years ago. The Hamilton theory part. I understand you're saying you can yeah, sure, sure. I wanted, no, 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 I didn't, uh, gosh. Sorry. Dangerous uh, topics here. No, I didn't. I just want to say this is the John Pardon thing is the thing that I can just push the button, and it has the has has the kind of local model that I want to put in and 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 use it. Of course, yeah, all the other uh, all this other work uh, that we could also use. Okay, so this would be the ring homomorphism. Um, Nothing is written on that, quite frankly. So the, I expect lots of kind of nitty gritty details coming out once once I start writing, and uh, going back to the stuff I had done maybe 20 years ago, and I've forgotten uh, largely. So I have like eight minutes. Um, so then there's this other thing, which kind of maybe you are already happy with this kind of uh, framework, but there's this other thing. Um, if you use John Parton's approach on the to write down virtual fundamental classes for in algebraic geometry or in complex analytic geometry, you would work with complex analytic models um, that are just given. So maybe I'll write this here. Uh, you know, C framework. So that works with with uh, with. So here's your modelized phase. And then you have some open subsets in here. U alpha or something, and then S alpha to E alpha in such a way that these. Um, sorry, that's wrong. Uh, so this is is then contained in V alpha, and the S alpha goes to E alpha, and the U alpha is the is the zero locus, so pre image of zero of this S alpha. Okay, so you get local descriptions of your modelized solver, of chunks of your local modelized space, complex analytically, in terms of uh, holomorphic functions with some manifold. So this is a topological manifold. So that is all fine. It gives some virtual fundamental class, but that's not the way it's being done in, in algebraic geometry, okay? And that's not the way Mark and I wrote down our rings. Um, rather, we use um, in algebraic geometry. So let me let me this is actually B. Um, from C analytic to algebraic. So we need to compare Pardon's VFC framework in C analytic setup. Note that this is really C analytic now, right? We, we would be doing, where is it? Um, that kind of thing and compare it once you have bubbles over here. Yeah? So that would, would somehow be generated to, to something that looks like, like this, and then you have a three puncture sphere here. This is the kind of thing you have to look at. And that bubble, this is really now a PQR. That's the stuff that appears in, in my definition of mark um, in, in QH0. So this lies in, in the central fiber. Okay, so and and of course the whole thing is a product. 
So you only care about what's happening here. Um, with, let's say, beer and fantiques in algebraic geometry. So this actually, um, John Harden pointed out, he has a student, um, let's get his last name right, Mohan Swaminathan. Um, that uh, who, who see this topic is to do this for Gromovitan theory. And he has apparently already uh, advanced pretty much. I'm trying to convince him that he should not do it just in Gromovitan setup, but in full generality, okay? Just assuming you have some, some relative obstruction theory from M over some Arden stack, <coughs> it's called A, a base Arden stack, which in Gromovitan theory would be the stack of pre-stable curves. And then uh, you get the variant Antiquis definition, but you could as well do John Porton's definition, okay? And um, so I have three minutes to give a few details on that. So what's the difference here? So in Baron van Teke's, let me, let me remind you, um, or even better if you have never heard of it, uh, how this works. So how do we do it in algebraic geometry? You would have, again, an embedding of an open subset inside some smooth space. That would be my V alpha before. Okay, let me, let me drop some alphas, okay? So this is, I don't care if it's a zero locus of a, of a, of a function or something, you could always set it up like this, once you, once you have um, an obstruction theory. And then you obtain a normal cone, which is just a relative spec of I um, to D mod I to D plus one, where I is the ideal defining, uh, sorry, that's wrong, the embedding of U in V. And that sits as a closed, as a closed subcone inside the normal sh yeah, linear fiber space given by the normal uh, sheaf. That's not a vector bundle, it can, can change dimension, but who cares? And the point of writing down an abstraction theory in the sense of Beer and Fanteki, is to embed that situation into a vector bundle. Okay, so you would have, you would have an obstruction theory, it's a morphism in the Dirac category, f minus one to f zero, to the truncation of the cotangent complex, um, so that's i mod i squared, Locally, that's locally just, okay? So that's a truncation of, gosh, I want to write something different. This is a cotangent complex of M over A. Um, and that would be I mod I squared, so this is locally, to uh, omega uh, M over A, not M over A. V over A, restricted to M. Um, given that thing, you get a diagram of linear fiber spaces that looks like, like this. So here you have the tangent bundle of the relative tangent bundle restricted to M that goes to the normal bundle uh, of uh, V over uh, of, of U in, in V. So here's your normal cone. And then this goes to F0 and F1, which are the corresponding linear fiber spaces. And then what you do is you construct this cone by taking the image here and making it invariant in F0. So something like F0 plus the image of C, U, and V. That might not be objective, but who cares? F0 acts on this. And then the virtual fundamental class is given by the intersection 
with the zero section. So this sits inside F1. It's a cone bundle. So and then you will write down M Birch as C a dissected zero section. Now what I suggest to do uh, is I mean, how, why is this, uh, how does this arise if you think of a section of a vector bundle? There's something called deformation of the normal cone. So essentially it means you, you scale your section and take the limit. And that produces a rational equivalence of this normal cone of, 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 of the zero section inside, inside, um, inside your, uh, that would be the V here, um, with a cone inside, um, uh, or rather, the graph of the of this of this uh, of your section with with the cone inside the vector bundle. So, and I suggest to uh, that should be possible to incorporate the kind of deformation of the normal cone in inside John Parton's framework. It's built into his framework. He already uses it. deformation of the normal cone in this in the topological category. Uh, not quite this one. Okay, I know that. Yeah. Okay. So that was it. Um, and hopefully, at some point. Uh, in the future, some of this will actually surface into a paper. Thank you for your attention. I'm just real <laughs> okay. I'm always happy to take whatever approach is around, yeah. but well, it would mean it would mean, mean I have to do to to do redo all of punctured gamma vision theory and log gamma vision theory in the the new framework. No, no, it's a proof system. <laughs> it's a proof comparison, but it's kind of easy to use. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's possible, but it's it's not very hard actually. I mean, I I, I did this comparison a long time ago, you know, twenty years ago, with with my framework, and I certainly now do this. Anyway, okay, but uh, yeah. My, my thing. Any other questions? Well, it's in the game. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.